Our, our minds are on what the Lord Jesus did for us 2,000 years ago. So part of our lifestyle is concentrating on what occurred for us in the past. But also, we ought to be thinking about the present because isn't that what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is? The Holy Spirit is ministering to us and through us in the present. He is causing us not only to remember the things that are in the past, but to realize that he has provided for us all the power that we need in the Christian life. The Holy Spirit reminds us of the fact that each and every day we are in a battle, in a battle because we have those that are not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world that are constantly bombarding us. So as a Christian, we, we think of the past regularly. Uh, I don't know about you, but... Every morning when, when I'm praying, I thank God for what he did for us 2,000 years ago. Uh, so we think in the past. We think in the present. Lord, use me today for your honor and glory. Um, have control of my behavior during this day. So we, we think of him in the present. But let me tell you, what keeps us really going and motivated is thinking about what the future holds for us. Uh, you know, what a wonderful future is in store for you and me who know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Looking forward to that day when we actually see him face to face. And, and, and what a joy and what a privilege it is to know him. So as a believer, <laughs> let there be light. <laughs> well, yeah, now I can see my Bible. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you, one of the wonderful things about walking with the Lord is, is that we have such a wonderful, uh, a wonderful plan that has been put out for us, a plan that involves the past, it involves the present, and it involves the future. So this is what has been happening, actually, to Habakkuk. Well, we don't really know how long it took him uh, to compose um, these three chapters, we don't know how long it was from what we see him doing in chapter 1 by worrying and wondering, and, and finally he gets to chapter 3 and he's now worshiping. But let's look at the text because it is going to help us to, to really understand um, how Habakkuk arrived at the situation he finds himself in. Um, you can divide the chapter really into three ways. In verses 1 and 2, he prays. And, and we'll look at this in, in detail, but in verses 1 and 2, we see Habakkuk praying. But then in verses 3 through 15, in that, that large section, he ponders. So he goes from praying in verses 1 and 2 to pondering in verses 3 through 15. And as a result of his praying and his pondering, we see in verses 16 through 19 that he praises. So he goes from um, praying to pondering to praising in verses 16 uh, through 19. So let's kind of look at this and, and kind of take it apart. So you notice in verse 1 it says, A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigianoth. And what on earth is that? Um, but you see, it, actually this word is only used twice in Scripture. It's used here in verse 1 of Habakkuk 3, and it's in its plural form. And it is found also in Psalm 7. And so at the beginning of the seventh Psalm, you'll see this same word, but it's in the singular rather than the plural. And it's all both of those are related to prayer. Actually, scholars don't know for sure the exact meaning of that term, but it appears to have something to do with music. It has to do with music because keep in mind that the prayers that we find not only here in Habakkuk, but the prayers that we see in the book of Psalms are prayers that were often sung. 
And of course, we know that's exactly what the Psalms were. The Psalms were actually sung by the children of Israel. And so many believe that this term, uh, Shigianoth, actually is a reference to music, making sure um, that they could remember what they were learning. Now, I, I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes, and I think I've mentioned this before, um, you know that commercials that are set to music are so easy to remember? You know, I mean, they could be commercials for things that you don't really want, um, but yet you can find yourself uh, humming the tune or, or singing the commercial. It's a way of, of remembering things. And, and this is why I believe that uh, spiritual music, biblical music, gospel music is so important in the life of the believer. Um, not only because it just brings joy in being able to express how we feel in music, but it also is great uh, for the memory. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the things that is going to be true when we get to glory is uh, there will be no one singing off key. Uh, you know, we, we, we will all be able to sing and, and sing joyfully as, as we, we praise the Lord in, in song. So when we go through this, uh, chapter 3, and you think about the prayer of Habakkuk, um, it is something that most likely um, was uh, set to music, and so we find that it is a prayer, and it is according to uh, Shigianoth. Um, a musical term, and here's what he says in verse 2. O oh Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O oh Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it, and in the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Now, I want you to notice that there are three things that Habakkuk is praying about um, in, in just this second verse. And, and they all begin with R. He, he says, first of all, I want you to revive your work. O oh Lord, I heard the report of you in your work. O oh Lord, I do fear. And in the midst of the years, revive it. That, that term that's translated in the midst of the years, really what he's saying is, while this is happening, while this is happening in our time, he said, while, while these circumstances are going on, and remember what the circumstances were that Habakkuk was uh, referring to, uh, Habakkuk was realizing that the Babylonians were soon going to be in the land of Israel. He has heard the report of what the Babylonians have been doing. And so what he's actually saying in his prayer, he's saying, look, while this is going on, while the circumstances are happening, Lord, revive your work. In other words, he's praying that the children of Israel will now get to the point where they are worshiping the Lord, where they are serving the Lord, where they are loving the Lord. Because remember, what, what has been going on is that the nation of Israel has really been going down the tubes, if you will, spiritually. They, they, they were worshiping the idols of, of Baal. They, they were resulting in uh, pagan worship and following the false gods. This, by the way, is the reason why the Babylonians were being sent they were being sent to, to not only punish Israel, um, but they were also there to kind of weed out though, those that were not true wheat and only the tares would be left. So this is one of the, one of the reasons for the judgment of God was not only to punish the wicked, but it was to reveal those that were really true. Because isn't that what often happens when difficult circumstances come into our lives? It is often a means of a test to actually prove our faith, to demonstrate that, yeah, this person really acts the way they said they believe. And so often trouble and difficulty uh, come our way in order to prove 
uh, the work of God in our lives. So the first thing that Habakkuk is praying, he says, Lord, please revive your work. Because that's exactly what the topic of verse 2 is. I have heard the report of you. Uh, I, I've heard how you have worked. And so he says, while this is happening, in the midst of the years, revive the work. But then he also not only wants him to revive the work, he wants him to reveal the work. Because he says, in the midst of the years, make it known. So he goes from the, the focus of reviving the work to now revealing the work. And what is the work? Well, the work is, of course, God working on behalf of the nation of Israel. God leading them, God guiding them, God ministering to them. So he, he wants that to be revived, but he also wants it to be made known. He doesn't want it kept a secret. And, and then uh, the third thing he prays for is for God to remember mercy. He says, in wrath, remember mercy. You see, uh, Habakkuk, we already learned in chapter 2 that H Habakkuk was un under the impression um, that God was going to punish the nation. He already knew that. God said to him, that he was going to punish the nation of, of uh, Israel. So this is why he says at the end of verse 2, he says, in wrath, because the wrath of God was coming, the wrath of God was coming um, with the Babylonian army, but he says, in wrath, remember mercy. Um, in the book of uh, Exodus, um, Exodus chapter 34 um, there is a, a wonderful word in here with regard to the mercy of God. In, in Exodus chapter 34, it says in verse 5, uh, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, that is with Moses, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation, and Moses quickly bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. So I, I wonder if this was in the mind of Habakkuk when he was praying not only for God to revive the work, not only uh, for God to reveal the work, but he wanted God to remember in mercy. He says, in wrath, remember mercy. Because in Exodus 34, God himself came down and revealed to Moses how his wrath would be poured out on disobedience, but yet he would also be merciful. And I, I love the way the Lord revealed himself to Habakkuk here, or, or to uh, Moses uh, here in Exodus chapter 34, because notice that he declared his name twice. He, he came down in verse uh, 34. He says, The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord. He said it twice, which, of course, was an, uh, a means of emphasis. And so he wanted uh, Moses to realize this is the Lord speaking. So he mentions his, his name twice, and he says, I, I am a God that is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And so it was this God who had revealed himself to the nation of Israel, but in spite of his revelation, many of them neglected to worship him or to honor him. And so you'll discover that he is praying for revival, revelation, and remembrance. So then he, he goes on and he begins in verse 3. 
And I want you to notice what is happening here in, in these verses between 3 and 15. It, it goes to the place of remembering or thinking about the past. Remember how we talked about us living the Christian life in three tenses. Uh, here in verses 3 to 15 is a real focus on thinking properly about the past. You know, very often people uh, say to us, well, no, don't think about the past. Just think about the present. Forget about the past. Well, the scripture never tells us to forget about the past. Oh, it does tell us to forget about our past sins. Because what often happens is that Satan comes along and he wants us to think about those things, those things that have already been forgiven and forgotten by God. Remember what the Lord said? He says, uh, I will not only forgive your sin, but I will remember them no more. And if he promises that, why should we keep remembering them? Um, but but here, is, here is the focus in, in Habakkuk. Um, in, in verses 3 through 7, I think he is talking about what occurred during the Exodus. Um, if you go with me through verses 3 through 7, you, you'll read about what he's talking about. It says that God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Now, why does he talk about this? Why is God coming from Teman and from Mount Paran? Well, here's the thing to keep in mind. Teman was actually a city in Edom. Now, remember where the Edomites lived. The Edomites lived south of Israel, and they were the descendants of Esau. That's who the Edomites were. And, and Teman was like the capital, if you will, of, of Edom. And it says that God came from Teman. What's he referring to? I believe he's making reference to how God followed the nation of Israel as they left Egypt. When the exodus was taking place, they, they left the borders of Egypt. They came into the land of Edom on their way to the promised land. Um, so this is why he talks about the fact that, that God came from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Mount Paran is actually the wilderness. This is a term that was made re uh, makes reference to the wilderness that is south of Israel. This is the area that the nation of Israel was following uh, on their way to the promised land, and God was with them. God promised that he would not leave them and he would not forsake them. Oh, I know we remember that from the book of Hebrews, uh, but God said that term uh, way earlier than the book of Hebrews. The writer of Hebrews was just recounting what God said in the Old Testament. Uh, but here it says that God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Par Paran, and his splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. Remember how God led them by the cloud and the pillar of fire. And, and so what is Habakkuk doing here? He is remembering what God did to the nation of Israel as they were leaving um, the land of Egypt on their way to the promised land. It says, his brightness was like the light, rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations, then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Kushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Now, what is Habakkuk referring to here? He once again is referring to this travel, this trek of the nation of Israel from the land of Egypt on their way to the promised land. This is why he said his brightness was like the light. 
You know, every time you see God referred to in Scripture, when he actually came down to speak with man, it was often preceded by flashes of light. Even on Mount Sinai, when God gave them the law, what was there? There were flashes of lightning. There, there were thunderings. Um, and, and you'll notice that uh, the Lord is often referred to as, as one who comes in light. In, in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, it says, um, he says, Keep the commandment unstained and free from the reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is now verse 15 of 1 Timothy 6. And he says, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. He is the one who dwells or lives in unapproachable light. The Lord Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall what? Have the light of life. This is why light is so often referred to in Scripture in reference to the Lord himself. And so this is what Habakkuk is remembering. He's remembering the one who showed himself. The brightness, his brightness was like the light of life. Um, think about all the times that God appeared. It, he appeared often with light. Of course, we already made reference to uh, Mount Sinai. Um, when, when he came to fill the temple with his glory, there was the brightness of his light that was seen there. Um, we, we think about uh, at the birth of the Lord Jesus, while the shepherds were out in the field, you know, what did they see? They, they saw this, this brightness, we saw this light. What happened on the Mount of Transfiguration? Same thing, there was the brightness uh, of light. We see throughout the book of Revelation that, that he himself is, is bright as the day. Um, we also know that he, when he comes, it says he will slay them with the what? The brightness of his coming. So all throughout scripture you see God and his appearance is associated with light. So he talks about his brightness was like the light, rays flashed from his hand, there, uh, and there he veiled his power. God didn't d d display all of his power, but they knew about his power. Before him went pestilence and plague, followed at his heels. That's exactly um, what, refer, uh, what is referred to in the book of Exodus, which led Pharaoh to allow the children of Israel to leave. It, were, uh, it was the, the plagues. He stood and measured the earth. Uh, I mean, do you think the Lord was out there with a tape measure? Uh, measuring? No, it actually that's a reference to ownership. It's a reference to the fact that he is the one um, who indeed um, owns the earth. The earth is the Lord and all of its fullness uh, belongs to him. But in the 102nd Psalm, it says, uh, beginning in verse 25, it says, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment, so you will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. And that's exactly um, what was uh, the focus of, of Habakkuk's prayer, um, where he, he talks about how God revealed himself. It says, the eternal mountains, um, verse 6 of, of uh, Habakkuk 3, he stood and measured the earth. He looked 
and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting waves. This is making a reference to whenever God appeared, there, um, uh, there was often that shaking of the earth that... Um, it would. It sounded like uh, an earthquake. Remember when he came uh, down uh, at Mount Sinai? It, it scared the daylights out of the Israelites uh, because the earth was shaking. Um, you see, the, the the mountains are his. He can do whatever he likes. He says, "I actually saw the tents, verse seven, of Cushan in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble, as as the." Children of Israel were approaching Canaan. They went through the land of Midian. And, and what happened there, what happens there, is, of course, the fact that God was revealing himself. He was constantly letting the nation of Israel know um, who he was and that he had power to lead them. He had power to provide for them. Um, thinking about the fact that one of the things that is true for every Christian is that we ought to always be thinking and be reminded of God's power. Be reminded of, of what God did for us in the past. He, he says this in, in the 77th Psalm. In Psalm 77, beginning at verse 11, it says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. I will ponder all your work and meditate on all your mighty deeds. That's a, pondering and meditating are very similar. It means stopping and thinking and thinking hard about what took place. He, he says, your way, O oh God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Jacob and Joseph. And so here this prayer of Habakkuk is focusing on God's power. I don't know about you, but uh, when I pray, I often like to repeat back to God the things that he has done in the past. And it's not to remind him, he doesn't forget it, but it's to remind me. It's to remind me of his power, of his might, uh, of his love and how he cares for his children. And, and so this is one of the reasons why we study scripture. Because everything that we read in the scriptures are either related to the past or they're related to the present, or they're related to the future, which is where our minds ought to always be as, as believers. So in, in verses 3 through 7, I think he's making reference to how God led the nation of Israel. But then he even goes a little bit further because in verses 8 through 11, um, he's really focusing how God has authority over the entire universe. Because look at what he talks about here. In verse 8 he says, Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation. Now what is Habakkuk referring to here? Most likely he is making reference to the fact that God interrupted nature, if you will, on behalf of his children. When did he do that? Well, think about when they left Egypt. Uh, they had to cross the Red Sea, right? And, and so God interrupted nature, if you will. You know, the, the waters don't normally uh, separate like that for people to walk by. Uh, and so here God is demonstrating his power over the cosmos, his power over the earth. He, he talks about the fact, he says, you strip the sheath of your bow calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. I think he's making reference here um, to the fact that through his power, how he changed the surface of the earth, he did that through the flood of Noah. Uh, he did that. He changed the, the, the mountains. He changed the valleys. He changed the rivers. 
And of course, he, he certainly did that to the River Jordan uh, when he allowed the children of Israel to cross through the River Jordan. So he, he talks about that. And very often, um, the arrows, this is a, a term that uh, the authors of Scripture often use in making reference to lightning. Uh, because it, it appears to be like an arrow through the sky. Verse 10 says, The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The churning of the ocean is, is again, just a, a representation of God's power. But look at verse 11. It says, The sun and the moon stood still in their place. Um, at the light of your arrows as they sped, at the flash of your glittering spear. Of course, we know from Joshua chapter 10 that God indeed did that. He, he stopped the moon and he stopped the sun. Both the sun and the moon are, are referenced in Joshua chapter 10 verses 12 through 14. And you'll see that once again, God interrupted nature. He showed his power. He showed that he is the creator and the sustainer of the entire earth. As a matter of fact, in the, in the book of Isaiah, um, Isaiah chapter 40, this is a, a, a very beloved chapter of the book of Isaiah, but I, I just want to point out verse 26 um, in Isaiah chapter 40, and it says this, Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. What's Isaiah referring to? Of course, he's referring to the heavens. He's referring to the stellar heavens, and this is why he says, lift up your eyes and high and see who created these. He who brings out the host by number. Um, as, as a matter of fact, in, in Psalm uh, 147, um, right toward the very end uh, of, of the book of Psalms, you'll, you'll discover that in Psalm 147, um, verse 4, it says, He determines the number of the stars, and he gives to all of them their names. Just as Isaiah said, he names the stars. Now, I know there are some that uh, here on earth that tried to name the stars, but they wouldn't be able to live long enough if they named them all the time uh, because there are so many of them. But God, in his wonder and in his glory, has, has named them all. But then we get to verses 12 through 15. So in, in verses 3 through 7, we see him focusing on the exodus, a demonstration of God's power. In, in verses 8 through 11, you see his demonstration over nature, if you will. He, he's the one that, uh, that, that not only created it all, but he's the one that can interrupt it at his own will. Think about Peter and the Lord Jesus walking on the water. Kind of defies the, the law of gravity. You see, God can and does because he is the author of all. Um, but then, so we see him doing that in verses 8 through 11. But then in, in verses 12 through 15, we, we see him um, in victory, if you will, in, in history. Um, because history demonstrates, again, the Lord's power. Look at verse um, 12. It says, you march through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. Now, that's an interesting word. You threshed them. In other words, he, he really uh, conquered them. He says, you threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. Notice that there are two subjects here in verses 12 through 15. There is a subject of judgment and also the subject of deliverance. And so when, when you think about how God is working through the nations of the world today, he is not only today, but particularly 
at the return of Christ, these same things are going to happen. Judgment of the unbeliever and deliverance of the believer. When you think about the tribulation period, oh, much of the deliverance is going to be through death, and death is a deliverance for them uh, because those that know Christ and are actually put to death during the tribulation period, what's going to happen with them? Absent from the body, present with the Lord. I've always said that for a believer, what is death? It's a change of address. That's what death is for a believer. It's a change of address. And that's exactly what's going on here. He says, look, you went out. You, you marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. That's, that's God pouring out his judgment. But then in the very next verse, verse 13, it says, you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. So while God pours out his judgment... He's at the same time delivering his own. And, and so it says in verse 14, uh, well, actually in the middle of verse 13, it says, you crush the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. Who's he talking about here? I think he's talking about Satan. Uh, I think he's talking about the fact that the enemy of our souls is, is the one that he crushes. I mean, right from the book of Genesis, chapter 3 and verse 15, we know that uh, his head is going to be bruised. <laughs> and, and that's exactly, I think, what he's referring to. You crush the head of the house of the wicked. Who's that? I think that's none other than Satan himself. In other words, what Habakkuk is, is thinking through as he's praying, he's reminding himself of God's power He's reminding himself of God's authority. He's reminding himself of the fact that God is in control, that nothing happens without his knowing all about it. And, and isn't this something that ought to encourage us in prayer? This, this is why when we pray, we ought to be reciting some scriptures back to the Lord. Again, not because he doesn't know them, but reciting them because we need to be reminded of them. And this is why scripture and prayer uh, go so close together and so that the scriptures ought to motivate us to pray. It, it says in verse 14, you pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors. In other words, some of the very fiery darts of the wicked one that we are told about in Ephesians chapter 6 some of those fiery darts of the wicked one actually turn around and they actually uh, uh, appear to crush the actually author of them as well. It says, you pierced with his own arrows the heads of the warriors who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I think he's going back now to what happened when the children of Israel were being delivered from Egypt. Uh, what happened when the waters then returned and the Egyptians were, were drowned in the sea. Um, when he took care of Pharaoh the way he did. So we see in verses 3 through 15, Habakkuk ponders. So he goes from praying in verses 1 and 2 to pondering, thinking through the history and how God operated on behalf of his own. But then he gets to verse 16, and verses 16 through 19, he now praises God. And incidentally, as you ponder the work of the Lord, doesn't it result in our praising him? So this is why prayer and pondering is so important for us as Christians because what is the result of prayer and pondering? It's praising. It's praising God for who he is and, and what he's done for us. So here he says in verse 16, actually this is now his response. This is the response of Habakkuk 
to the things that he has been saying to the Lord, to the things that he has been pondering in his mind, here's how he responds. He says, I hear, verse 16, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Now, I want you to notice what is happening to Habakkuk as a result of his thinking through not only what God did in the past, he's now moving into the present. Because in verse 16, he's now thinking about what is ahead. He is thinking about the fact that the Babylonian army is at, is at the door. The Babylonian army is about to come and conquer our people. The Babylonian army, they were well known for the atrocities that they committed. And he knows that they're at the door. So he says, I hear... And my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound, and rottenness enters my bone. I think what he's saying is my knees are getting weak. He's getting weak in the knees. I think that's what he's making reference to when he says that the rottenness enters into my bones, and my legs tremble beneath me. He's actually nervous, and he's frightened about what is about to take place. Yet, he says, look at the end of verse 16, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. See, one of the things that God made clear to Habakkuk in chapter 2 was not only was he punishing the nation of Israel for their idolatry, for their rejection, of God. He was not only punishing them, but he is also going to punish the Babylonians. Uh, and so this is what he's making reference to when he says, I will quietly wait for the day of trouble. He says, I know it's coming. But yet he says, uh, I'm waiting for the day of trouble to come what upon the people who invade us. So he was patiently waiting for God to accomplish his purposes and accomplish his will. You know, we, th we think about what's going to happen during the, the tribulation period. And the tribulation period is a period where God is going to be pouring out his wrath on the unbelievers. But keep in mind that in judgment, there is always mercy. Of course, this is, this is what... Uh, Moses told us in Exodus chapter 34, in judgment there's always mercy. So as God is pouring out his judgment on the world for their unbelief and rejection of him during the tribulation period, and particularly on the nation of Israel, he is also going to weed out, if you will, his own. And so door, even during that judgment, his mercy is seen in that he will also deliver those that have come to faith in Christ during that tribulation period. So he, he, he's now uh, praising God for what he's going to do, even though he says, I'm getting weak in the knees when I think about it. But then he knows that in verse 17... He knows what has always been the case, that when there is war, there is always economic collapse. And that's what verse 17 is all about. Verse 17 is about economic collapse. Look at what he says. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the, the, produce, uh, the produce of the olive fail, and, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there will be no herd in the stalls. Man, what's he talking about? He's talking about, boy, when this Babylonian army comes, what's it going to do to our nation? 
Well, it's certainly going to interrupt our livelihood. It's certainly going to interrupt how we feed ourselves. Look at all the things that, that are going to fail. And all of these things were things that the nation of Israel actually depended upon for their survival. You know, they, they de depended upon the fig tree. They depended upon uh, trees producing fruit. They, they depended upon the olive trees to produce olive oil. They, they depended upon their flocks uh, for, for both milk and, and for food and, and for wool, for their clothing. Economic failure, economic collapse. Are we worried about that? Are we worried about that happening? I mean, this is something that has been happening down through the ages. Economic collapse. But what has God promised? He said, I will never see the righteous begging bread. He, he said that he will provide all of our needs. Think about Philippians chapter 4. My God shall what? He will supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And then in that very same chapter, Philippians chapter 4 and, and verse 4, he says, I will rejoice, and again I say rejoice. Even in the midst of such terrible circumstances, Habakkuk is going to rejoice in the Lord. Look at what it says in verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Now, as, as believers, uh, joy ought to be part of our lives each and every day. Joy ought to be part of our lives because of the fact that God is on the throne and God is in control. And, and, and he has promised never to leave us, never forsake us. And he has promised to make sure that we have what we need. Not always what we want, but he makes sure that we have what we need. So he says, yet I will rejoice. Even though the economy is going to fail. Even though the Babylonian army is at the door, even though I'm shaking in my boots, even though I will rejoice. You see, Nehemiah told us that in Nehemiah chapter 8 in the 10th verse, it says, the joy of the Lord will what will be my strength. The joy of the Lord. This is why you and I are to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice uh, is what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. He says, verse 18, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Verse 19, God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. You know, I don't, have you ever seen those uh, uh, films of, uh, of the deer on the Alps and, and how they, they come down the side of the mountain and you wonder, well, they're going to fall right off. Uh, but no, they don't. Um, they're able to plant their feet and, and God takes care of them. And he's, this is why he said, uh, he's going to make my feet like, like the feet of the deer, like hinds feet. Um, there's a verse in, in the 18th Psalm, in, in Psalm 18, it says in verse 33, it says, He made my feet like the feet of a deer, and he set me secure on the heights. So what, what is Habakkuk saying here when he says, the Lord makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He makes me tread on my high places. He's saying God is going to provide my security. My security is in him. My security is not in the economy. My security is not in my social security check. My security is not in what I have in the bank. My security is in 
the God who makes my feet like the feet of a deer, who even though what appears to be collapsing around me, he has promised never to leave me or forsake me. And interesting, at the very end of verse 19, he gives some instruction to the choir master. And he says, use stringed instruments with this song. So it, it, it's wonderful for us to be able to, to sing praises to the Lord. But, but I, I want you to take a couple of things away from, from this study of the book of Habakkuk. Uh, because often we, we do find ourselves wandering and worrying like Habakkuk did in chapter 1. When we take a look at what's going on in the world today, it often causes us to worry and wonder. But then as we come before the Lord and bring it before him, it also causes us to watch and to wait and to see what God's going to do. Uh, I'm sure for all of us, we are in that age bracket where we have seen our country go through a lot of difficult circumstances. And I know there, there were times um, in our lifetime where we wondered, what's going to happen? What, what, how, how was this all going to turn out? And we're, we're watching and we're waiting. But you know what? As a result of looking into the scriptures, while we're waiting, we're waiting on the Lord. And, and what does God tell us? That if we wait on him, we, well, what? we're going to renew our strength. We're going to mount up with wings like eagles. We shall run and not be weary. We shall walk and not faint. And it, and it results in praising. So what do we take away? I think there are three things. you find them there in your notes. True biblical prayer includes humility, adoration, and praise. And that's exactly what Habakkuk did. He realized that he didn't understand it all. I, I, I love the fact that when you read situations like this, situations like Habakkuk was encountering, that God gave revelation without explanation. Now think about that. God often gives revelation without explanation. We don't need God to explain everything to us. We don't need everything explained. We just need to believe his revelation. So when God says he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Um, and we may not know how. We may not understand how. But we need to believe his revelation without explanation. And there are times when Jesus was asked questions, and you know what he did? Instead of answering the question, he would ask another question. And, and so often there was revelation without explanation. And it helps us to comprehend what our role is as believers, to walk with him humbly and adore him and praise him. Lesson number two, waiting on God, even lifelong waiting, demonstrates godly faith and perseverance. We can wait on the Lord, and we may not see the answer in our lifetime. Because often God works in such a way that he realizes we don't need the answer, we just need to keep trusting. And so sometimes in our lives, we need to just persevere in belief and in trust, not necessarily receive the explanation that we really wanted. Revelation without explanation. And then thirdly, remember God's power and promises are key motivators to keep trusting during distress. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that exactly what Habakkuk had to go through? He certainly had to keep trusting during a distressful time. 
So that's exactly, I think, what Habakkuk wants us to know and understand. Realizing and remembering God's power and remembering God's promises, that's what motivates us to keep trusting during times of distress. Well, it has been good being with you for these four weeks uh, in this um, relatively unknown book of Habakkuk. But Lord willing, next Tuesday, Pastor Rob will be back, and he will begin a series of studies in the book of Genesis. So uh, beginning next, uh, next Tuesday, the Lord, will be, uh, the, the Lord will be using Pastor Rob in ministering to us uh, from the book of Genesis. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, I'm sorry, let me answer a question first. Don't know. We know very little about Habakkuk. We basically know that he was a prophet. We don't know where he was born. We don't know how long he lived. Uh, we know that he was a contemporary, however, um, of, of Jeremiah. Um, but we don't know exactly um, where, when he died uh, or when he was born. This, again, revelation without explanation. <laughs> Is what it was. Loving Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of gathering together as a body of believers, coming before you, Lord, realizing that your word is powerful, your word is true, uh, your word expresses to us your, the great love wherewith you loved us. We thank you, Father, for the salvation that you provide for us through the death and resurrection of your only begotten Son. We thank you, Father, for the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Uh, we thank you, Father, for the fact that you have promised never to leave us nor forsake us. We know, Lord, that you are in charge and you are in control. And so, Father, help us, Lord, to accept your revelation, even though we may not have explanations, because we trust you and we believe you, and we thank you for the love that you have demonstrated to us so faithfully. Father, we, we pray for our church body, those that are in, enjoying the time at the Creation Museum today and tomorrow uh, at the Ark. I just pray, Father, you bless them abundantly as, as they focus on you and all that you have done in days gone by. I pray, Father, you'll give them a safe trip home. And Father, dismiss us today with your blessing, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.